To me, diversity is really about presence and representation, right? From different groups and perspectives and background. Uh, we talk about equity because we also want to think about fairness and justice. Um, and then inclusion is really that environment that you create where are people feeling valued, heard, productive, um, seen. And I think all three of those really work together. Um, one of the um, uh, sayings that I really like, there's a, a woman by the name of Renee Mays who was formerly the uh, chief data officer of Netflix. And she said, uh, diversity was like being invited to the party, whereas inclusion was being asked to dance. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for coming on the show. Hi, Richie. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start off just by um, seeing if you have any success stories of companies where they've implemented diversity well and it's had a big impact. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't start by talking a little bit about how we approach DEI um, here at Truist. So, you know, I like to start with the fact that our company, like a, like a lot of other companies, but um, maybe a little different and a little special, we start with our purpose, right? In terms of how we think about building better lives and communities. And that means for the people that work for us, as well as the people that we serve in the community. Um, and part of our, our values are actually about caring. And so when you start there, one of the goals that we just intrinsically have as an organization is we want to make sure that we are creating really a, an inclusive environment and we're making the right uh, moves and changes in the way that we do our work in a way that we think really helps, again, our teammates in the community. And so we focus on you know, goals, just like everything in our business, right? We want to make sure that we have a really great return for our shareholders. Well, we also want to make sure that we have strong representation by women or people of color. And so we've set goals to that end around increasing our representation, um, both in terms of women and eth ethnically diverse populations by 15 to 20% um, respectively. Um, and to do that, we have done certain things like we have a chief di uh, diversity officer. We have, um, again, diversity goals and a framework that we implement. And we have pushed to the business units as well um, the opportunity for them to sort of craft and mold this in a way that um, can play out uh, appropriately for the line of business. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we do in enterprise um, tech and ops. The, the last thing that I would also say that we've been very sort of goal-oriented around is also making sure that we're improving our supplier diversity. So again, teammates, community, those that work with us, and, and there we've also set some goals about increasing um, uh, representation and sourcing uh, for our RFPs, et cetera. Um, so all of that really speaks to kind of a framework, and I would say intentionality about creating diverse and equitable and inclusive environments with outcomes that we think are important to our lines of business. That's very cool. I do like the idea of it being a goal-driven approach. Um, rather than just a sort of uh, a sort of general, this would be nice to have, and not really having um, a, a direction in terms of how you get there. Um, so I'd love to talk about that more. Before we get to that, um, can you tell me um, about the sort of the flip side to this? Like, what happens if you don't do diversity and inclusion right? Do you have any examples of problems this has caused, uh, perhaps in other businesses or organizations? Yeah, I mean, so I think on the positive, right? When you do it well. McKinsey has studies about uh, increasing and outperforming your peers. And there's studies that show that, you know, during COVID, um, where there were higher representation of um, gender diversity, uh, there was more stability or better response, let's say, like in the COVID um, pandemic. So then, okay, well, that's good. But what happens if I don't do it? Well, I think you start to see things like um, products and services that maybe um, aren't as um, inclusive as they could or should be or missing features, quite frankly, that would best serve your customers and clients. So I think, again, um, you miss out as a company, right? Again, in terms of being able to connect with your customers, I think that your organization um, misses out on the potential for really fantastic problem solvers and product developers, et cetera. Um, and I think in these 
this day and age where there's truly a war on talent and particularly data talent, right? You don't want to overlook that talent and you don't want to be overlooked by that talent because they don't see um, what they would expect to see in terms of uh, a DEI program and or representation in the ranks of your company. That's kind of interesting that um, it, it's really about making sure that you're not missing opportunities, but it's happening on both the external side, like uh, missing opportunities with your customers, but also in terms of talent as well internally. All right. So um, getting back to your point about like uh, setting goals around this, um, I'm curious as to how companies can um, align their diversity programs with other business metrics and make sure that um, the diversity program is sort of aligned with their business goals. Um, how do you think about that? Yeah. So as we mentioned, it's it's, it's good business, right? It's uh, lots of studies are, uh, show that it's it's really something intrinsic with how you do business. And I, I like the fact that we have empowered our lines of businesses to also contribute to the type of programming that we um, create around uh, diversity, equity, um, and inclusion. And so I think it can be multifactored as we've sort of tried to approach it, right? It's who you hire. It's the products and services that you create. It's the way you um, uh, interact with like your suppliers, um, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I think it can start with something very um, uh, basic around we want to increase the representation. I think you want to look at uh, you know, not just within the general pool, but are you having a pull through effect? Are you um, promoting people as well into roles? Are you giving them really great, I think, stretch assignments or assignments on newer technology that allows them to grow into the, um, the, the technology that's being leveraged? Um, and then I think it's also uh, about, um, you know, tying it specifically to your goals and outcomes, right? So again, as you mentioned, it's not just a good thing to do. It's because you actually want to see um, something different show up in terms of how your business produces a product, service, or experience. Okay. And before we get in any deeper into this, because uh, we want to talk about both diversity and inclusion, I think it's something where people often get um, a bit confused about what's the difference between the two. Do you just want to like talk about like what each of those things means, uh, just so everyone's on the same page? Yeah. To me, diversity is really about presence and representation, right? From different groups and perspectives and background. Uh, we talk about equity because we also want to think about fairness and justice. Um, and then inclusion is really that environment that you create where are people feeling valued, heard, productive, um, seen. And I think all three of those really work together. Um, one of the um, uh, sayings that I really like, there's a, a woman by the name of Renee Mays, who was formerly the uh, chief data officer of Netflix. And she said uh, diversity was like being invited to the party, whereas inclusion was being asked to dance. So that's kind of the easy way I sort of think about it in my mind. Um, and again, I think all of these work together for a really comprehensive approach um, that supports the outcomes that you're looking to drive. Okay, uh, I really do like that as an alternative. Like, yeah, uh, general the party, and are you actually? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you never got dance. necessarily asked to dance. <laughs> with me. <laughs> yeah, uh, like I'm not sure many people want to see me dance, but like uh, it'd be nice to be asked. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Uh, all right. So uh, it feels like, um, it, at least in terms of diversity, one of the most important sort of elements from a, a business point of view is how we go about um, hiring. Mm. So I'd like to talk a bit, about, a bit more about hiring strategy. And I guess this starts with um, with the with the adverts. Like how how are you showing off? Like <laughs> how are you attracting candidates or potential candidates? So what changes can you make? to your job adverts to make them more appealing to a diverse audience? Yeah, so one, I think where you go and where you place yourself, whether it's adverts or your, you know, um, the people that you want to hire. Um, and so let's maybe, let's walk it through a little bit like early career, right? What schools and colleges are you going to? Are those schools and colleges diverse? If not, do you have additional um, places that you would go historically black colleges and universities or universities where their um, body is fairly diverse so that you can, you know, cast as wide a net as possible. 
I love this idea of also how do you write your descriptions, your job descriptions. There's been some work done around what are you asking for? How are you asking for a day in a life versus, you know, this very rigid, do, 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 you must have this. And, and we know some populations, women versus men, might respond differently to certain ways that things are, are written. So I think that's also um, important. Who you leverage to interview the panel is also important, right? And they, there's been studies that show the more diverse your panel can be, the more likely you are to convert folks into the hiring process um, as well. And then one that I also like to um, employ and I, I like to encourage folks to think about is your network, right? And um, if I only, if I have a very narrow network in terms of who I know or who I go to to ask questions or, hey, do you know a really great person, um, I can end up with a very sort of homogenous group of candidates that comes through. And um, my husband likes to um, remind me that while I'm an introvert, not everybody likes to go make just general conversation with people and expand their network and, you know, gather new friends. Um, but I do think it's important to be intentional about thinking about how do you put yourself out there, even if it's uncomfortable or unfamiliar is maybe a better word for it, so that the spaces and places that you're, are, you occupy are a little bit more diverse and you can source from, right, um, that population when you're looking for um, new talent. Um, that's really interesting, the idea that um, maybe a particular you need to have diversity in your people team or your your HR team in order to increase diversity of like the actual candidates who are going through the the interview process, um, or perhaps even being sourced by recruiters, right? Or even the team, right? Like when when we recruit them in, sometimes our HR department does a really great job um, sourcing diverse talent, and then we have a not so diverse panel that interviews them and is judging and deciding who actually comes in. I want to pick up on something you said about um, changing the, the writing within your job adverts and how different people might respond differently. Um, do you have any examples of this, um, like from maybe a, a, a data analyst or data scientist type job advert? Yeah. So rather than like um, writing, you know, something like 10 years of LLM models, right? I would challenge myself, do I really need that? Or do I need somebody that's maybe had more contemporary and maybe less time? right, with um, those types of models. Um, if I'm going to list out all of these, um, again, sort of uh, five years of this, three years of that, all these languages, can I talk more about what the job entails? I want you to use these skills, and some of them will be te technical, some of them might be interpersonal. You will work with these types of people or these types of problems. That may, um, that may resonate with a variety of people. And I, I think about data as being a very multidisciplinary type of um, field, right? And so I, I want to uh, appeal to as many different types of people as possible to help solve these really tough problems that we have. I have to say, uh, even for you, if the job advert is just like a list of skills, then that sounds super boring. It's like, well, that, that's what you want from me, but you don't tell me what I'm getting out of this, what I'm going to be doing. And yeah, there was a terrible job adverts. Yeah, like and that. I'll tell you, even like my 27-year-old male son would not respond to that these days, right? He's looking for like, tell me the adventure I'm going to go on and this horrible problem I'm going to solve and the amazing people I'm going to work with. He would actually respond to a very different kind of writing. Uh, that That's really interesting stuff. Um, so um, I think, Maybe one of the challenges with hiring when you think about diversity is you have to think about diversity of skills across your team. You've got to think about like diversity of personality. And then um, it's fine if you've got lots of people applying for the job, but if the, the candidate pipeline's a bit thin, then you might start to like think, well, okay, maybe we don't worry about demographic diversity here. And that's when you can run into problems. So I'm just wondering, how do you sort of prioritize all the different types of diversity when you're hiring? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's I think it's a hard one, right? Like the, the nerd in me wants to, oh, well, I'm sure there's a formula we can create <laughs> to make this work, right? But it's not. I mean, I think I think you cast a wide net. You create a really um, you spend time creating an inclusive environment. So the people you bring in, regardless of their backgrounds, understand the values of the group, the company. 
um, understand that they are valued as part of the group and the company and the expectations of how you work and perform, how you, um, how you, uh, you know, I don't want to say rate each other, but how you learn to, you know, work through issues and solve problems and celebrate and recognize one another are well understood. And I think that inclusive environment, right, helps to reinforce that um, the choice that they made to join you was the right one um, and a good one. So I think I, I like to think that it's not one or the other. I'm not pitting a group against each other. I'm not, it's, it's better if you're Black. It's better if you're disabled. It's like, I want to create an environment where whoever you are and whatever your intersectionality is, you feel included and that this is a place you can really thrive and grow. Okay. And I guess there's some sort of feedback mechanism there where if your existing employees are feeling included, then mm. it's going to encourage them to try and hire more people and that's going to sort of benefit your pipeline. Does that sound like it makes sense? Yeah, I think so. And I think as the uh, environment becomes more diverse, right, then again, that network and the, the pools that you have access to also start to diversify. Again, it all starts with intentionality. It doesn't happen because of rainbows and unicorns. It happens because you um, you've decided to be intentional. You decided that this was an important um, element of how you build teams. Okay. Um, I'd love to talk a bit more about team building uh, in a bit, uh, but just, uh, another question about hiring before we get to that. So um, I think uh, bias in hiring is maybe one of the sort of hidden problems that you need to overcome if you want a, a diverse team. So what sort of steps can a company take to increase awareness of like the types of bias you might find in hiring? Yeah, I mean, again, I think you start with some of the things we've talked about before, which is, um, you know, um, looking at your practices, uh, looking at who's interviewing, looking at where you're going to get folks from. I love this idea as well as um, making people aware of where there could be bias and giving them tips and frameworks around how they overcome or mitigate, um, you know, biases in, in the practice. Because I think if you ignore it and you want to pretend that it doesn't exist, you'll just repeat some of the same failings and, and, and miss out on the opportunity. Um, you know, it's, it's more of a, a framework we've used with our data teams in terms of how we uh, encourage them to really think about, um, you know, removing bias, not only in the in the hiring practice, but as part of our framework, we had um, Dr. Brandy Ice Marshall come in and she talked about this peer principle, um, a framework that she used for, uh, you know, helping to mitigate bias really in data. But our, part of the premise that I love is it starts with like who the P, who's actually participating. And it was interesting. We had um, teammates, data scientists and data analysts, et cetera, across the organization um, really appreciate like a framework and a concept for them to think about um, because, they, it, you know, nobody was doing it on purpose or uh, didn't assume um, that it was all perfect and, 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 and good. Um, but helping with a, a framework for them to think about, OK, how do I get more participation and access on my team. Um, and that being, again, an intentional goal and thought that they were having. Again, I think that awareness and, and literacy is really important to overcoming what the biases um, could be in the process itself. I like the idea that there's a, a framework, sort of definite steps you can take in order to try and um, like identify and, and reduce these biases. Um, so. Uh, maybe moving on to um, in inclusion type stuff. Um, so what do you think the most common uh, problem areas are for inclusion? Like wh when do you have this like diversity, but then people aren't being asked to dance as yeah. it were? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, um, again, I, I tend to be a little bit of a Pollyanna, right? So I don't think people come in and with bad intentions. I think if you're not being intentional about it, there, there are just things that could happen, right? Um, and so I think sometimes it's just slowing ourselves down a little bit so that we can pay attention to what might be, you know, our natural in inclination. So I think about things like, um, is everybody being heard in the room, right? 
uh, am I, because I'm an extrovert and I love to talk, 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 talk. Are there moments where I need to be quiet or specifically call on somebody I'm not hearing from? And I, and ask not really sort of general questions, but, um, poking on, did I hear from or hear the experience? Is there a perspective we are not considering to draw in um, more voices and invite them, right, to actually participate um, in the conversation, in the debate, in the feature that might be uh, being discussed? Um, And again, I think you need all voices in the room to be able to do that in a really proactive way. That's interesting. They mentioned the idea that um, if you're an extrovert, you need to learn to be quiet sometimes. So I guess the, the, flip, the flip side is true. If you're an introvert, you need to sort of force yourself to speak up sometimes. Yeah, that um, idea of being uncomfortable a little bit, right? Um, yeah, I guess make yourself uncomfortable <laughs> to be successful. Um, are there any sort of less painful ways of doing that? Like, do you have any tips of uh, for like how you can balance out um, the difference between uh, extroverts and introverts being heard um, in a sort of maybe systematic way? Yeah, you know what? We, we also try to make sure that we're, there's, a, there's a way to get feedback, right? One of the things I love about technology these days in our society to some degree is like there's lots of ways to give your opinion, right? Whether it's, um, you know, uh, through technology, your star rating, or, uh, you know, it's even a simple thing is just drop an email. And, I, and again, I try to make sure I'm very intentional about inviting people to do that. And I'll say things like, I know everybody doesn't just want to speak up necessarily in this meeting, or people may need time to process their thoughts, right? Feel free to drop me an email or have a way for folks to provide that email, um, whether it's anonymous or with their name or whatever, what have you. The other thing that I think is important in this context is to show people that you're listening to invite them to continue to do that, right? Because there's nothing worse than I give you my opinion. It goes off into the ethers and I don't see anything um, that happens um, based on this feedback. I've told you that I I don't feel like we do enough to bring um, different um, people into some of the, you know, more technical experiences or I've told you, um, you know, I I don't feel like I can talk about my um, uh, same gender spouse, right? Okay, well, you need to act on it and be very transparent, right, that you're doing this because of feedback so that people know that you heard it and you're doing something. You're not going to be able to fix everything and react to everything, but I think it is important to show progress um, against what you're hearing from your teammates as well. I really like that idea of having feedback mechanisms, also having different forms of communication. So if some people are more comfortable writing things, then that's great. If they're more comfortable having chit-chat with people, you know, you can have a have ways to have a conversation. Um, so I guess related to this, um, one thing that's like the bane of everyone's life at work is is meetings and <laughs> doing meetings well is like the secret art that like everyone needs to get better at. So I'm just wondering, do you have any tips for making meetings more inclusive? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, it's going to be what I say, not necessarily what I'm awesome at doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sometimes. Um, again, I, uh, I, 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 will sometimes get called out myself, right, on what is the meeting about. So I do try to make sure that I can give people the heads up about the nature of the meeting, maybe a couple of things that we're going to cover, again, so people can prepare, right? And then you're transparent about your intentions, but if it takes me a moment to process, I can maybe do some research or think about what my response is going to be. Um, be clear on what the expectations are coming out of it. Are we just going to talk and we're going to, you know, brainstorm or do we need to come out with a decision and how do we get there and drive to it? Um, Again, I like this idea of inviting the quieter voices in the meeting to also participate, whether it's before, during, or after with some of the, you know, feedback mechanisms we talked about. Um, But given that, yes, our life is spent... um, in endless meetings, I, I think those are one of the things. And then again, I don't know that this has to do with inclusion, but maybe about effectiveness coming out of meetings. Um, I like when meetings aren't done on the half hour or hour, meaning that, you know, it's done at 20 after, if it's a 30 minute meeting or, you know, 45 minutes after, so that I've got time to process action, do the thing I said I would do before I move on to the next meeting. And I think that gives everybody an opportunity to really, um, you know, action and process what they've what they've been through. 
Absolutely. I have to say, I agree. In theory, all my meetings would have an agenda beforehand that everyone's seen and, uh, yeah, just quite off like <laughs> that. Um, so yeah, as, aspirational goals. Um, all right. <laughs> so, uh, maybe let's talk about, um, how you actually go about implementing, um, a sort of diversity and inclusion or even DEI program. So, um, I think it seems like getting some sort of executive buy-in is going to be quite important because this needs to be an organization-wide program. So how should you go about this? Yeah, I think one, one of the things that's key is, um, like you said, that buy-in and whether it comes um, top-down or what, I, I do think it's important that somebody at the senior level is the champion and is driving this, right? Um, we're very fortunate here at Truist. It is something that's truly embedded in our um, executive leadership team. And we have a chief diversity officer, right? Whose remit, um, Dominica's um, remit is to help us really grow and expand, um, you know, our goals and our frameworks, et cetera, and the programs that we have around um, DEA. But it's not just one person's role and expectation. I think the other strength that we have and some of the best practices I've seen at other organizations is when you have a really strong and involved um, business resource group or whatever you want to call them, whether they're, you know, um, created by, um, you know, whatever flavor of um, diversity, whether it's women or, you know, people of color, LGBT, um, differently abled um, individuals, um, where they kind of get to set the agenda right, of what's important and how they see these items um, playing out. And then, as I mentioned earlier, getting the lines of business involved. So we have, you know, uh, finance, enterprise technology, our wealth group, they have their own um, DEI organizations where they're really tailoring how um, they work through the objectives that we have as an organization and um, help make a difference in their lines of business. So I think Again, the uh, focus of the organization, the intent of the organization, leadership um, top down, but also I think really um, uh, participation by as many of the, uh, the teammates as possible makes a difference. And then the last thing I think is, um, I, I think can also be special secret sauce, let's call it, is when allies are really active in this framework, right? Meaning. I am not um, personally, physically uh, differently able, but I uh, involve myself in those organizations um, and learn, um, hear the conversation and participate in things and solutions that we can do. I think that allyship is also really important um, to help further the goals. I like this idea of having sort of different organizations within, like representing different communities within your your, your wider uh, uh, business or organization. Um, I'm curious as to how um, like the human resources or people teams going to interact with these. Um, is this something that uh, is driven by them or is this uh, something they're involved in separately? That's collaboration. I would say the framework, the overall framework that we have here at Truist is really set by um, the uh, DEI organization, so Dominica Graham and her team. And then we take it within the lines of business and we sort of um, uh, come up with a roadmap for how we're going to implement it. So within enterprise technology, what does that mean? I may be going to, I may have a different um, way of improving my hiring, right? I may be looking at different conferences and different schools. I may be looking at uh, mentorship programs within my organization that are specifically tailored to technologists. Um, we actually created last year a women in technology group, right? That was in addition to the DEI work that we were doing um, more broadly across enterprise uh, technology. I've seen groups out there for, you know, Black women in data, um, as there tends to be a, a dearth of women of color, let's say, um, in the field. So, um, I, I don't think it has to be one size fits all or just one versus the other. But I do think that there's what's important for us here at Truist is that there's collaboration um, so that I'm pulling through the goals of the enterprise and really just tailoring it for how technology is going to do it. Um, and then asking you know, questions about what specifically do I need to do as part of the, the data organization to continue to support those goals as well. So I guess. 
if you start running a DEI program, then at some point someone's going to want to say, well, is this a success or not? So how do you go about measuring the success? I know you talked about having some goals beforehand, so maybe you can just elaborate on on like what, what counts as success. Yeah. Yeah. So for overall, from a truest perspective, I talked about, you know, increases in our representation. So, you know, having, um, looking for uh, increase in our female representation or ethnic diverse representation. I also look at some, um, I don't want to say softer metrics, but um, looking at the type of programming that we do. So one of the things I think about in my role for data is I'm always wanting to build a data culture. Well, part of that data culture includes conversations around DEI and or, you know, removing bias from, you know, the field or at least mitigating for it and thinking through it. And so we look at programming and sometimes I'll, I'll point to you know, I did a three-day program and I trained, um, educated, you know, a thousand people on these topics. Um, and, you know, I might have gotten feedback, good, bad, or indifferent um, on that. Um, I might also look for, um, and if I was super sophisticated and everything was inventoried and libraries galore, right, do we have um, code or ways that we are cataloging as part of how we do our data work specifically. So taking it from um, maybe something that is just business specific to something technically I'd actually want to see where I'm making it up, 50, 60% of our X models are going through some sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, models for detection of bias, et cetera. So I think you, you can start small. And as you get more um, mature and maybe even more, a little bit more technologically advanced, you can also throw in some um, additional ways to measure uh, your co- improvement or even maturity, right, on the topic. That's actually fascinating. It's something I've not really thought of before that um, it's not just about like diversity of like employees. You just don't, I don't figure out, I don't know, the genie coefficient or something of like your, your employees by team, but it's also, in terms of like the models you're creating, particularly like in data and machine learning, it's like um, that's part of like responsible machine learning is figuring out have you got bias there and just implementing that systematically. Interesting. Okay. Um, so um, how do you ensure like the accountability of like any managers or sort of team players who are uh, involved in this sort of program? Yeah. So what gets measured, get managed, right? So there are our metrics that we look at. Are we getting better? Are we holding flat? Um, you know, and, and if we are um, sort of, you know, where we expect to be, okay, what else do you need to look at and start thinking through? The, the training and education and the conversations we talked about. So there's, um, you know, there's uh, training that the organization gets to, um, you know, avoid the things we want to avoid. Um, and then, I, again, maybe slightly softer is this idea of what are the conversations that we're also having, right? And, and do fe- people feel like their voice is heard? So we have an employee engagement survey, um, and in there we'll ask questions that are also focused on DEI, um, inclusion, and about how people feel um, about um, how they're treated within the organization. So I think there's a variety of metrics um, that you can look at to really show that you're making the improvement. Um, Or if you are not, or you're moving backwards, right? Something that lets you know that there's probably work to be done and and, an opportunity for focus. While we're on the subject of um, sort of measuring things, um, I remember there was an experiment with, Twitter a few years ago, I can't remember which CEO was on there, <laughs> had quite a few, but um, they were talking about having um, diversity measuring it at a company level in terms of like diversity of employees, but then they would have individual teams who are saying, okay, we'll have like a whole team of just women or something. And the the team level diversity didn't matter as much as the whole company level. I, I'm assuming how you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's much slicing and dicing, right, that you can do. Um, and again, you're not, I don't want to say it this way, but I'll say it. You're not reacting to everything, but I think you're looking for what's important for your organization. I, I do uh, things that are important to me. I'll just say it this way, right? As a woman and a person of color, levels, right? So if all of your diversity, it's, 
um, in the most junior places of your organization and not represented in senior management on your board, et cetera, I think there's an opportunity, right? If um, all of your diverse talent is in support functions and not in revenue or code producing functions, I think that's another area to look at. So I do think you want to slice and dice the data um, for things like equity, right? Because how that could play out is, again, your products and services aren't as fulsome as they could be. Um, People making the most money is not as, it doesn't represent a huge diverse um, uh, representation of your population, be it, you know, the function or the city or wherever you are. Um, so I think you do want to look at um, various dimensions of the data. Um, I suppose it relates to this, um, it seems like um, this can be a tricky area for data departments because um, if you've got a customer facing role, it's a pretty easy to pitch to say, okay, if we increase the diversity of our account executives, you know, you've got people who look just like the customers, you can probably see that pretty quickly in terms of the metrics. With data, diversity in data is harder to measure an impact on, on the business, or at least it's harder to tell a story about that. So I'm just wondering if you're trying to improve diversity in your data teams, what's the what's the sort of pitch to management yeah. for this? Oh, it's it's products and services, right? I mean, and experiences. So I think about, um, you know, some of the studies that have been done. And again, um, not, not just one reason, but um, did the data that I collected, are the teams that are looking at it, the, the people that are challenging if the solution is fit for purpose, um, do they really represent a diverse perspective, backgrounds, experience to be able to guide me where I go, right? And so I think about some of the studies out there where, um, for example, um, the image products or products and technologies that we're using image don't do as good a job identifying or differentiating um, lighter skin from darker skin, right? A product can have a very adverse impact to somebody with darker skin if you're not training your model to be able to detect that, right? And we've heard all kinds of stories with horrific um, examples um, where, you know, the error rate might be small, but it's still impactful, particularly on certain populations. Or am I, did I train my model um, or create a model with whatever training data that um, disproportionately um, favors one population or another. We have a joke in my family. Uh, we uh, we uh, applied for a certain financial product, and I'll leave it at that. And I am the primary breadwinner. Um, and I got declined, and my husband, whose uh, stay-at-home dad, got approved. He's got a credit history, had a job, all that kind of good stuff. And later, came, you know, um, you wonder and you hear about, you know, models that maybe weren't... Um, as equitable as they could have or should have, right? And then, again, you learn, because again, I, slightly Pollyanna, I don't think people go in with this to be malicious or to harm certain populations, but as you learn um, that the outcomes aren't what you want them to be, you need to go back to the lab and come up with another model, right, that has a different outcome or a more equitable um, outcome. And when you think about the explosion of AI um, software and into the decision-making process, even in something like using AI to do hiring, Right. It's, I think it's incredibly important that you have um, diversity in the process of who's making these um, products, the data that's used to train the products and the people that are contemplating how these products go to market. And I guess in the, the credit example, that's straightforward. They've just lost your business. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's kind of bad outcome for you, bad outcome for the organization <laughs> right. as well. Uh, so yeah, getting this right is going to sort of help people's yeah help companies' revenues, help uh, increase customers' satisfaction, um, and that's like a fairly benign example, I think. Um, okay, so 
I guess, do you have any examples of where diversity has been built into products successfully? Um, and, you know, the company's done it properly, they've made things fair, and, and it has worked. Yeah, I don't know that I have great examples, but let me, t- let me tell you two things. One, I love the way that you asked that question, because I think that's important, is that you're building in this concept or consideration, right? And the reason I say I don't know that I have a great example is because if you did it well, I shouldn't know. I should just know that I'm attracted to the product or the service and I have an opinion and it worked really great. So I think about things like, um, you know, legally now, there's things you need to do when you're creating products and services for people that may be disabled under the ADA, right? And if you do it up front, right, I may not need... um, technology that reads to me the description of the picture, but you've built it in and you, you could build it in in a very um, elegant way that benefits um, folks that are just differently able that may have, uh, for example, a sight impairment. Um, and in a way that is um, perhaps even a, a side benefit of being instructive or something for, for me who is not sight impaired. I think about just consideration in the product. So um, again, do you consider um, things like uh, people's various pronouns, right? And just for data entry, how you're capturing and maybe tagging and identifying data. And then there's the really, really, really hard stuff, right, around training data um, and the effects. Like we know our data has biases built into it from decisions, structures, whatever that were in the past, is there a way that you can augment the data? And are you thinking about that as you're building your products up front um, so that you've got as much data to make the best decision possible? I love that. Um, there, was, there are some sort of real practical steps you can do to um, improve diversity. Um, are there any sort of... Um, process changes you need to make just in order to ensure that you are making all these steps in terms of uh, building diversity in? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think you should be building this into um, frameworks, right? And whether it's your model development process, where at least you're asking the question. I think, um, oh, it's um, like AI now has an impact framework that they've put out there. NIST, even in their frameworks, talks about, you know, considerations for, they'll tell you exactly how, but that you're building in consideration for these types of things. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about um, Dr. Randy S. Marshall's process, and it was about thinking through um, PEER is the, the acronym that she uses, and this participation, who's participating in building these things, um, but also um, who's got access, not only to the data, the data that's selected, what gets promoted, what gets limited, um, but who, who's got access to the technology. I love the way OpenAI actually came out with their product, right? Because you've got a lot of people banging on it and asking it questions um, that that will become part of its corpus, right? And part of the lexicon of how the language is is leveraged. Um, Inclusion, you know, in her pair principle talks about um, engaging, very intentionally engaging diverse or marginalized communities uh, and can you evidence it, right? So that you know that you, what, you know, I did, I asked and I got information and I used it or I didn't, right? Um, and then representation being the last bit around um, do you have representation from all demographics that you need within the data or the system or the framework? Um, and then this last bit, I, I also love around, and are you crediting people for their contributions, right? That again, this idea of whose story is being told or who's part of the conversation about what gets created, the value that gets um, created as well. Okay. And in that last case, where you're talking about um, sort of showing off the representation, are you talking about like the people who are uh, creating the product, like within your team, or are you talking about like the the users and the sort of, um, all the different groups who are actually using your product. Yeah, a, a little bit of both, right? But the, the idea that um, they're represented in the data, this idea that dark skin and light skin is represented in the data, um, that the frameworks that you're using are going after um, making sure that there's representation there as well. And you mentioned uh, OpenAI as being an example. It just seemed like um, with this sort of explosion in the use of AI, this is going to be a bigger issue, just making sure that um, these AI products um, 
are fair for all the groups that are using them. Um, do you have any advice specific to AI in terms of um, reducing bias um, or otherwise making them fairer? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we've touched on a couple of them, right? So, you, you know, you could start with pair. I love just having this framework that you can use. Um, how you collect the data and what kind of data that you have. Um, you know, check it for um, both are there biases built into it or uh, is there unrepresented data that I actually need to go um, and get? There's also, you know, um, one of the things that I kind of love about uh, the data field it, as well is this um, movement into um, more inclusive design principles, like true, almost a little bit becoming more like software design, right? Where you're actually thinking about how it gets used, how it gets consumed, um, and building that into the design process, right? So in as much as it's a design, um, bias awareness techniques that we talked about earlier and making sure that it's there. I also think you're going to monitor, right, and measure, which we, we, we all know we should be doing with our, our models in, um, in data. Um, and so you're looking for ways to um, look for impacts right, and equity on various populations. You're going to ask yourself, again, this concept of being uncomfortable, you might need to ask yourself on some uncomfortable questions and actually test for that, right, in the outcomes of your, um, your product. And then maybe last, much like we talked about earlier around, um, you know, literacy and culture, I think increasing the literacy of your team around these issues um, is important. So as I mentioned here at Truist, you know, a couple of years ago, we actually did, a, it was a three-day half session um, with Dr. Brandeis uh, Marshall around how do we incorporate these concepts and teaching people to think about it. Um, you know, Brookins talks about um, companies um, need to think about and actually debate the trade-offs. So as you're going to market, I think having the lexicon and uh, a place where people come together to talk about the trade-offs of, okay, really effective, maybe very surgical, but oh, I'm seeing adverse impact here. Are we all good with that? Or are there things we should also be doing and including um, maybe humans in the loop, right, to help deliver a message or provide options for, you know, whoever's consuming this product or service? How do you envisage that um, humans sort of interact with these sort of AI ideas and uh, like who gets the decisions? How, how do you decide, like, how does that affect diversity? I guess is what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, I, 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 think, um, I think looking at in some sort of framework where you decide where you are applying the technology, right? Where you might not need a human in the loop, for example, maybe on a back office, you know, system, uh, I'm looking at uptime and I'm doing some self-healing using like AI, right? I may not need as much of a human in the loop in that. But I think you do want to consider where there are times and places and spaces where it's best to have human decision makers helping you to really think about um, the solution, the output, et cetera. And I, I, and maybe I'm an outlier, I kind of feel like I, AI is most powerful when paired with the human. Right. Not to override. Okay, I was told my husband, if Waze told you go left, just go left. You know, <laughs> you don't need an overrider all the time. Um, but I do think um, it's it's a powerful opportunity and maybe even a little bit more surgical way than we have in the past to really help humans be more effective and e efficient um, at doing certain tasks. Right. Um, and so I think you you you'll. I, I think you, we're going to end up with different types of jobs that still require humans, right? Because in terms of how you deliver this and um, how you use that expertise to hone the output is going to be important as well. I think there's going to be a lot of people want to learn a bit more about this uh, topic. So do you have any advice on like uh, communities or resources people can use to find out more about diversity and inclusion? Uh -huh. So I, I love to follow certain thinkers. Um, you've heard me mention Dr. Marshall a couple of times. Um, Dr. Ruman Chowdhury as well was part of the, um, I think she was part of the uh, AI ethics team uh, at Twitter at one point. Um, Dr. Joy uh, Bulamini, 
Um, also, uh, and I just love the, the name of this group. Uh, I think she was part of the founding group or pioneers for the Algorithmic Justice League. I think following people who think about and talk about these topics is really important and making sure that that group is diverse, right, as well. Um, I think there's some really great studies out there. You heard me mention um, the McKinsey study. Brookings actually has a really nice uh, independent piece as well about um, helping to mitigate uh, bias in data. Um, not as you know, sexy and maybe as uh, interesting. Um, some of the legislation that's coming out of Europe where they're actually tackling this, I think a little faster ahead of the US, I think it's also kind of um, interesting to read and keep up with. And then, like I mentioned, um, with, um, you know, some of the business resource groups, I think joining support organizations that focus on um, varying populations in these topics are also important. So I think about groups here in Georgia, like Women in Technology or Girls Who Code or, you know, Women in Data and AI are great groups to also follow um, and, and participate in. Um, excellent. And. Um- if someone spots um, a problem with diversity and inclusion at their own organization, do you have any advice on how to start tackling it? Yeah, I think um, I think people should speak up um, and and not be afraid to do that. Uh, I remember being part of a presentation just recently where um, the collateral was talking about heroes and data, and it was. It was a, a wonderful lineup of diverse men, but it was all men. <laughs> and I said, are there no women <laughs> in this universe, uh, you know, ecosystem that you And, you know, they just hadn't considered it. And so the second revision had um, more genders um, presented, right? So just speak up. I mean, there's very um, polite ways to say things you don't make me, you don't need to make people feel horrible about themselves. But I think speaking up is important. I think advocate, um, you know, as a senior leader, I try to make sure that I am uh, talking about these issues and that I'm visible about these issues so that people understand it's important to me. Um, I think, again, if you're in the out group, you're not in the group being an advocate and an ally. So if you're a male for women, if you're white for people of color, if you're um, cis, uh, you know, you, you should advocate for our LGBT um, teammates as well. And I, I, I personally have been, I think, a recipient of people advocating for me that may not have looked like me or had the same background or whatever, what have you. Um, and then maybe the last one is to be curious, right? Uh, where if those of us in the data field, that's, that comes very naturally to us to ask questions and ask more questions and poke and look for the data and then ask more questions. And I think if we apply that also to one another, um, I think that also helps create moments of understanding and helps to really build and foster that inclusive environment we talked about. Um, that's great advice. Although maybe like, don't poke your colleagues literally. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. Uh, so uh, do you have any final advice for people who are thinking about diversity, equity and inclusion? Yeah, I think just be intentional about it, right? It's a, again, it doesn't happen just because of a, I hope this all gets better um, and be courageous. This this is hard, difficult, um, messy, sometimes deflating things to go after. But, you know, continue to be courageous and push through and then keep learning. Don't poke your colleagues, but keep learning. <laughs> <laughs> all right, perfect. Uh, thank you for your time, Tracy. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for your interest in the topic. This was wonderful. 